downward slightly to, to reflect that interface issue with the residential zone. Yeah, look, I um, sorry, the internet connection somewhere is a little bit patchy. Um, let me know if you can't hear me, but um, I agree with Mr. Robertson on that. I think that it is sensible to apply that that small change. I've, sh I've shared my screen here um, just to make sure we're talking about the same thing. Essentially, we're talking about the noise limits between these commercial zones and the residential in the middle. Yeah. That's so, right. So these yep. commercial zones will feel that pinch a little bit, um, particularly for their nighttime operations. It, mean that, it means that if they have loading from this side, from the, the side facing the residential, they might find it hard to conduct activities at night and comply with the noise limits. During the day, it shouldn't be too much. Yeah, that, that, that was going to be <coughs> so part of my question. was going to be if there was a truck idling on the side, and loading and unloading, how loud would that be and could it comply? Yeah, I, I mean, it's hard to get us an idea of the scale of these sites from a zone map like this. If they could achieve a reasonable degree of separation and perhaps load their trucks, you know, right down the side of the building or towards the back adjacent to the state highway and do a loop around and then exit, they might be able to work that. I think loading on the side of the commercial zone facing the residential would be very difficult to do at night. But during the day it would be possible. For the day it would be workable, yeah. And I, I don't see those commercial activities in those strips, those narrow strips being able to be particularly intensive commercial activities from a noise point of view. Um, unless you, you designed it very carefully to make sure that your noise sources were screened as far as practicable and, and down the back or um, arranged in such a way that there was no direct line of sight to the general residential. Thank you. So the, the, the sound's kind of a bit odd at the moment. Uh, was, a, was that your last question, Mr Demery? Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, nothing for me, Mr. Styles. It's been really helpful. Um, so thank you for for putting that together. Very good. No problems. Good. Um, Mr. Burgoyne, Ms. Ryan, how 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 are you doing? Um, I think while we're here, Don McKenzie is online and available, and I think has a few. Um, aspects from a transportation perspective that he wanted to point out and then and then answer any questions um, you might have. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, there's probably only four um, points emerging from some of the questions and uh, conversation that's uh, taken place, particularly with regard to transport matters arising from the applicants, um, transport advisor, Mr. Ormiston and uh, Mr. Norman for Waka Kotahi. Uh, first of all, I do agree with both uh, Mr. Ormiston and Mr. Norman um, that the TRA um, references to the transport chapter of the district plan is a positive, um, that that gives a, a good framework um, that is consistent with the transport assessments and the, the overall process that has been worked through um, across the district. Um, so I, uh, I agree that that is a, a relevant uh, change that has occurred um, and I, I support that. Uh, and with the addition of the specific matters, the 500 household um, extra assessment level, um, I think starts to um, go to another point that I think um, Commissioner Dimery, you uh, raised, uh, I think with Mr Norman earlier this morning um, with regard to the effect of progressive development and maybe the, the differences um, from assumptions that uh, Mr Ormiston might have used in the ITA in support of the plan change. Um, I think that that does address that matter, that at least at the 500 household level, 
um, there will be an assessment of the way in which development is progressing and whether that mix of residential and commercial retail and other activities within the plan change area will able to be captured. Uh, and that in addition with the TRA uh, matters under um, R15 and R16 um, for individual activities, I think those matters will be addressed through that process. Um, it, it is a matter that I was concerned about um, with the, the original ITA um, accompanying the plan change that sort of the, there were a, a number of assumptions in terms of how the mix of activities were going to develop and particularly around the way in which there was going to be internal traffic movements um, expected between residential and employment, residential and retail. Um, but I think as, as we've heard from uh, Mr Ormiston in, in his rebuttal and the further summary, uh, I think that matter um, is able to be um, addressed. Uh, the, the other matter um, that Mr Norman raised was in terms of the specific assessment and the potential extra effect of the plan change area on the, um, the State Highway 1 roundabout. Um, I, I do appreciate that view. Um, in an ideal world, each of the ITA integrated transport assessments that are prepared um, as the plan change area develops will address um, the, uh, the surrounding and, and potentially affected road network. Um, but I do agree um, that in addition to the current considerations within the precinct provisions that call for consultation or, or the, the outcome and, and the process of consultation with Waka Katahi um, in respect of the state highway routes, um, that in addition of a, of a specific assessment of that intersection um, at State Highway 1, the roundabout, um, could be could be included just to provide a, a belt and braces approach and address that matter um, that seemed to be uh, Mr Norman's primary um, concern um, when he spoke to you earlier today. Um, and then I think the final matter um, that uh, tested quite a bit of uh, or, or took quite a bit of uh, consideration and questioning was around this retrofitting of existing roads to achieve the anticipated outcomes um, that the ITA um, for the applicant was based on. Um, I am um, conscious and, and it's, it's relatively pleasing to hear Mr Marshall um, or consultation with Mr Marshall who's with the roading um, section of the council, um, generally comfortable with the expectation that there could be works made uh, or changes made to existing roads. Um, by the developers, um, but in consultation and agreement and to the satisfaction of council um, that could achieve the outcomes, uh, particularly in relation to walking and cycling provision. Um, it, it relates primarily to the internal traffic movements, um, but it also does point to my view that those provisions are important to ensure the, um, the expected outcomes um, that Mr Ormiston presented, um, particularly with regard to the proportions of walking and cycling and internal trips and, and cross visitation was one of those terms that uh, has been used. Um, without those sorts of facilities, particularly in terms of the attractiveness of walking and cycling for internal trips. Um, the, the methods um, by which that could be achieved, I think um, Ms Ryan and uh, Mr Burgoyne may well present to you some alternatives in terms of the, the mechanisms and structures to achieve that. Um, but my experience with, with some other um, activities, particularly in the Auckland context, um, is that there are separate outside of the district plan processes, developer agreements, um, which could sit alongside uh, potentially some sort of objective um, 
uh, criteria um, that sit within the plan change, but the actual mechanism sits outside of the plan change, um, which together um, may well address this matter. Um, but from a from a transport point of view, I think it is important to identify a, a mechanism that helps to achieve the the form and the function of the internal road network um, that has been relied upon um, in the assessments made, uh, particularly by Mr. Ormiston. So I'm I'm happy to answer any of the questions on those matters or anything else that is of interest to you. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Dimery, anything from you? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. McKenzie. I think that's captured nicely a lot of the discussion we had. So thank you for um, your summary and views. Thank you very much. Uh, just just one from me then in relation to that last point, which was the the alteration to those existing roads, and and you 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 know clearly pointed out that it was part of the um, the assessments carried out for the plan change. The plan change assumed that that they, those works were going to happen. Um, yes. Would it be a fundamental flaw if they didn't happen? Uh, in my opinion, the external traffic effects of the plan change would likely be unaffected if those um, matters were not achieved. It is more around the internal traffic um, situation, the, the movement of people via non-vehicular modes, uh, I think is, is the key thing. It probably goes to safety issues as well. If those uh, changes were not made, then you would be reliant upon a relatively wide standard carriageway, um, whereas I think the assessment and this issue of the uh, the internal traffic movements, the cross visitation, I think would be reduced. I don't think that um, that the non provision of the the walking and cycling um, facilities would, for example, um, generate somebody deciding to go to One Tree Point or to Ruakaka, um, but it, it would just reduce the, the convenience and the safety, which is still a, a valid point that we need to be considering, um, but I don't think it, it goes to sort of an external effect of the, uh, of the plan change. Great, thank you. That was the only question for me. Thank you, Mr McKenzie. That was um, a, a, a nice way to get through those issues. Good. Great. Thank you. Pleased I could help. OK. Mr Burgoyne, Ms Ryan. Yes, so there are, um, there are a few planning uh, and district plan architecture issues. However, I think at this stage, a lot of those are a little bit more detailed and um, rule specific and looking at specific drafting of provisions and how things fit together. Uh, and in the interest of time and completeness, uh, Kelly and I have had a chat, Mr. Ryan and I have, have had a chat and think that it might be uh, uh, more complete to provide a written response on some of those matters. We're happy to take any questions um, that pertain to us. But in terms of a more detailed response over the last couple of days, there's been a lot of issues that have popped up. And I think in order for us to cover all of them off tonight, uh, we might be here quite late and it might be more um, uh, cohesive, I guess, if we provide that in a written response with some potential drafting options and things like that on some of those issues. If, I mean, I, th I think that would be useful if you're happy that, that you do it that way. Um, I'm just thinking procedurally how we deal with that with Mr. Allen. Um, did you, Hello, sir. Can I, I put a bit of some, somewhere? Very strange sound going on in the background of some of those speakers. Uh, obviously, if if the if you have questions for the council officers tonight, that's fine. Um, yeah. If you prefer to wait until or to get the written material, that's that's fine. I think I, I'm happy to present something oral tonight, but yeah. clearly we can't respond to the council material until we've got it. 
Um, so any written response we do is going to need to follow what the council do. And I'd have to say also, um, we've just heard a lot of material from Mr. Styles, which is new and um, strikes me as quite dis distinct, quite different from what we've heard from other parties. Um, not necessarily in terms of the relief that the 250 meter depth is something I've not seen anywhere in the country and um, including in any of the relief sought by Waka Katahi or Kiwi Rail. And I don't understand them to be seeking that today, although or in their submissions, albeit that Ms. Butler as a planner said that it'd be nice when asked the question. So um, there's some material there that I think I'd like to speak to Mr. Ibbotson about and whether he needs to respond to it technically as well as us responding to it um, in terms of uh, a, a legal response or, or a reply yes. response, because that's quite, a, we are outside the box we've been talking about throughout the whole of this hearing at this point. And so, so I mean, clearly we, we could um, get back together tomorrow morning, even though we've, we've gone late, hoping we're not going to, um, but I don't know that necessarily helps really in, in so much as I think having a written response from the council with some ideas about how to address some of these issues would be would be perhaps more helpful than, than just spending longer on a verbal um, discussion with the council and a response from the, the council in the morning. Yes. Um, so I think moving forward it would be good to have that from the council and I, I fully respect that you have your your right to to see that and and include that in your reply. But if we get in a situation where, um, and likewise the Mr. Styles issue, I'm more than happy that we have something from Mr. Emerson in in writing. But if you feel that at some time we need to get back together to hear from him in person, or we may decide that we need to hear from him in person, I, I think we can't discount. Um, that, that unfortunately we, we just got to see how we go I think once you've seen the council once we've seen yes. uh what Mr Robertson says and then decide whether we need to get back together then so that that probably means that your your final written reply um has to be ha held off for that doesn't it yes I think that's correct sir um and to be fair I haven't heard Mr Styles's comments were more about I think it was sort of a not theoretical, but it was a very technical response on a number of matters. Of course, that feeds into a planning determination as to where you balance matters. Yes. And, and um, that's why we have planners that synthesize all the information from all the other uh, disciplines. I wonder if it's going to take, I suspect, a little while for Mr. Burgoyne and Ms. Ryan to put together their written response. And I, I'm not sure that they're offering to give that to you at nine o'clock tomorrow morning, and I understand that. Um, so what we might have is a timetable going forward on that. And if we're going to do that, then I could simply address you now orally on what you've heard, deal with things to the extent I can, um, but acknowledging that we're going to need to come back with a bit more technical response. And, and that might include, for example, if the officers are saying, well, look, if you're going to grant the, the, the plan change, these are the provisions we now recommend, and we can come back with a response to that, that, that red lines that to get it to, to narrow down the matters of difference. Um, but I've certainly got some notes here that I could take you through at this point and um, hopefully reasonably speedily. But uh, yeah. yeah, shall we, shall we talk about time? I'd say this we can do it tomorrow morning. So it might. That might save us having to meet again tomorrow morning because I yeah. suspect the council won't be ready to proceed tomorrow morning given the expression they would like to do something in writing and obviously yes. they need sufficient time to think about that carefully will then reply at some point after that yeah. um, in terms of an exchange and then you can make a decision as to whether you'd like to and we can make a decision as to whether we would ask you to have a, um, a resumed hearing just for the reply and yeah. for discussions with the officers so so in terms of times should we talk about time skills now and then and then finish on yourself rather sure. than have have your 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 um draft yes. reply um, so moving forward, Mr. Burgoyne and Ms. Ryan, how long do you think you might need to get that together? Because there has been, we've, we've actually had a, a short hearing, but there's been an awful lot of information um, and an awful lot said. Um, and I, I would rather you had time to fully consider that, particularly in terms of considering the provisions and your suggestions regarding those rather than rush it. So. 
Um, sensibly, how long do you think you, you may need? Uh, we have all day so we can um, work to get it done by the end of day tomorrow. OK. Um, uh, Mr Allen, I think the next um, or, or concurrent step is Mr Ivertson considering what Mr Stiles has said and putting forward anything he wishes to say about that. Yes. I, I don't know how long he may need for that. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's right now, it, it, it may be one of the plus four. In, in Zoom land, uh, Mr. If it would like to appear. I don't know he is. There we go. Oh, hey, Mr. Riverson, you, you, um, I, I presume you've heard the conversation we, we're having. Um, uh, yes. Mr. Stiles has, has uh, provided us with some information this afternoon, which um, it probably does only seem fair that you do have an opportunity to to comment upon, which we may have some comments for you on. Um, when, how long do you think you'd need to to consider that and put some thoughts down? I'm quite constrained tomorrow, so it wouldn't be by the end of the day tomorrow. It would be at some point, hopefully early-ish next week. So can we put a, a, a time on that end of Tuesday? OK. Or, or would you need end of Wednesday? End of Wednesday would be better. I think it then after that, the next stage, as I see it, unless you see it uh, different, Mr Allen, um, I think Commissioner Dimery and I would, would need to look at that and decide whether or not we need to reconvene the hearing. Uh, for some questions, because I think if we start trying to do questions in writing, that's going to get yes, yes, too complex. Um, but we, um, I'm desperately trying to think what my week is like next week, and you may have heard my um, Microsoft Outlook isn't um, behaving this afternoon. Um, I can tell you my week is not good because I've got a hearing um, yeah. next week. So um, for me. Um, in terms of a written, obviously you'll need to make a call as to whether we need to yeah. resume, but I need to get a written reply to you at some point, whether we resume or not. So um, you'll be, you, you would be putting that together the week after next rather than next week. I, I, well, I certainly, I would I would struggle to get it done by the end of next week. I've got a little bit of distraction. Well, let, let us say that we're getting Mr. Ribbertson's by the end of Wednesday. So Commissioner Dimery and I will, um, will go through that and touch base before the end of next week, before, Friday, the end of yes. Friday next week, so that you know the following week we can get back to you and you know yes. the following week what we think. I mean, it's more likely than not that you, we'll just be asking for you to reply, I'm sure, but um, just in case. So, I, so we aim for a day by which I would have that. Um, and I guess for me, um, sometime towards the end of that, the week of the 8th is better for me, just, just because of the well, you just make it the end of the, 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 the that week. Okay. Um, so what, what days am I talking about? Next Friday is going to be the 5th, is it? Yes, I think that's yes. right. Yes. And so you'll be the um, 12th. But that is subject to our... Um, um, just confirming that we don't want to, to have a chat with, um, have any questions direct from Mr. Robertson. And obviously, if, if you do have a discussion with that or with the council officers, um, <clears throat> logically, I'd speak after they have been questioned. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Um, OK, so that's that's a bit of a time scale that we work to now, and we're no um, by the end of next week, whether we're definitely sticking with that or whether we need to, to find an, another date to all meet that. Um, so I think that's got all of the. Um, um, procedural matters out of the way. Unless someone tells me I'm wrong and um, we're now in your hands, Mr. Allen, to run through your initial. Uh, uh, your initial reply. 
try and find my little pieces of paper which are scattered all over the place. So, um, um, and I've got some things I'd like to put on the screen if I can at various times, but um, that could be an exercise too. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> let me start Sue, by saying um, we, we have had some work done on a plan with dimensions mm. um, and showing in particularly the 100 metres, put it this way, um, the intention when allocating the zoning boundary between the residential and the others um, was that it be 100 metres. So along the western, sorry, the eastern boundary, if I can call it that, um, and we might have a, a version that's usefully here. I'll try this. Yeah, that this is this is something that's um, in across. Right. If I just share the screen, this is a work in progress. I'm not. I'm just going to show it to you, but I'm not going to supply it to you because it's not entirely accurate yet. No. Um, and these figures won't, won't come out clearly to you, but there's a line coming down here. Yes. That's the 100 metre line, which is not an unheard of figure in terms of discussions with uh, uh, Waka Katahi and discussions with Kiwi Rail about um, where controls might apply. So the intent is that within that 100 metre line of the road, we have the commercial zone. Beyond it, we have residential. You'll appreciate that, of course, through much of the cities, where rail and road go, arterial roads go, we have residential right up to the boundary of that. That's, but this has got a, a buffet area, if you like, in that activity. <clears throat> to the north, um, the designation runs through here. It does some rather strange things in terms of shapes. Yeah. Land, I understand, still hasn't been purchased, but there's a 100 metre um, line between this curve here and the edge of the land, there's another 100 metres between the, the, sorry, the edge of the zone. It's also 100 metres between the cent, what it happens to be the centre line of the of the designation here, but that sort of peters out of the end, and um, the, the zone boundary that runs along in this location. So the 2A noise area, yes. runs 100 metres down from the edge of the, designation. The zone boundary is inside that, but as you've heard in some, there's a circumstance where the noise area goes further than the zone boundary does. So that if you've got a house in this location, you're going to need to address the rule in, that, that applies in 2A and that requires the ventilation, the other matters. Yes. I think there's a discussion about air conditioning coming through on, a, on appeal, but um, again, where that gets to, who knows? Yeah, but in the event, um, the intention was, and uh, I think somebody had a, a maths to 97 metres. That's the width of the line. The intention was that it be the the one, the 100 metres yes. as, as the mechanism. So we will get you something that's a little clearer than this and tidies up some bits and pieces. But that's the the essence of where we are on that. Right. Thank you. Um, I can begin with with Kiwi Rail. Um, the first thing I need to say is you had a discussion about jurisdiction. And Mr. Pilkington tells you that the appeal seeks to change the noise and vibration that the, the Kiwi Rail and Wakakatahi appeal seek to change the, the noise and vibration provisions in the plan. What it in fact does is seeks to change the transportation provisions in the plan. And I do have somewhere here a copy of that appeal. Go. Again, if I share this screen, this is the Kiwi Rail Holdings Appeal on Whangarei District Council um, on, on the plan changes. As we scroll down, we'll see scope of the appeal, general reasons, specific reasons, key setback of buildings and structures from railway corridor, the introduction of a single rule to the transport chapter. Again, the transport chapter is um, referred to here. If we come down to the relief section, 
Kiwi Rail seeks that the transport chapter is amended to include the following new provisions. Then there's a table, TRA, transport, and as a secondary and alternative relief, it seeks to change specific zones, city centre, mixed use, waterfront, commercial, local commercial, neighbourhood, etc. It's not seeking to change the noise and vibration chapter. So in terms of jurisdiction, and I, I don't, Mr. Pilkin and I have a disagreement, I think, in terms of how the, the provisions or, and, and the law might apply to this, but in any event, the appeal we're dealing with does not seek on its face to change the noise and vibration chapters. Now, Mr. Pilkington says that the scope of the Kiwi Rail appeal is for the Environment Court only to review, and you can't. So he's really saying to you, please take it on trust that notwithstanding the fact that we don't talk about the noise and vibration chapters, that's really what we're trying to change. And mm -hmm. in my submission, you're perfectly entitled to say that on its face, this appeal, which continues to talk about the transportation chapters all the way down and at no point refers to the noise and vibration chapters, is dealing with that. And it, we don't have an issue in terms of jurisdiction. And, and I agree entirely with, um, with Ms. Shaw on that. It, it's not an issue. Um, in any event, I would say that you are able to change, we are able to change um, provisions in an existing chapter through two plan changes operating separately from each other. Of course you can do that. Um, they have different effects, different focuses. Um, they are dealing with a similar topic, but the Kiwi Rail appeal is dealing with that on a district-wide basis. This appeal is dealing with what do we do with the zoning of a specific piece of land. Um, now, the Kiwi Rail submissions, um, legal submissions, then went on to talk about reverse sensitivity. I'm going to make the submission again that I still haven't seen any evidence that tells me how Kiwi Rail is affected in, the, in terms of reverse sensitivity. We understand there's an interface issue between the rail and the road and residential. That's what we're talking about. But I, I don't think that's genuine. I think that is genuinely a reverse sensitivity issue. It's probably more academic than, than critical to your assessment, of course. Um, Kiwi Rail then said and argued that you can treat the site differently because it's unique in the context of its surroundings. And I think there were some questions there saying, well, is it the surroundings or is it really the activity that happens on the land? Because, of course, a debate about the surroundings isn't actually telling you what's unusual about the relationship of this land with Kiwi Rail's land. Um, the argument was that the Marsden Point line has higher freight use than other parts of Whangarei Rail. But where are the equivalent rules in Wellsford or Hobsonville or West Auckland, which are the equivalents? The answer is we don't have any. Because through the entry plan process, we didn't get any. Um, if there are to be additional controls for spaces along busier lines, then again, surely that's logically brought in through the urban and services plan change because you might get a series of provisions that are um, nuanced depending on the busyness of the line that you're dealing with. And I understand that logically um, could be an outcome. I've, I've got no idea whether it will be. Now, in terms of the merits, um, as Mr. Badham has said, and Mr. Ibbotson has said, um, there are some provisions that are, are proposed that are a specific response. And of course, the zonings alongside the, um, the rail and the zoning indeed alongside the road is part of that. The application of the noise areas, 2A as opposed to more generic to, where you do have a ventilation control, is part of that. Um, beyond that, though, we say that the issues that were raised are really best addressed district-wide, um, and the Kiwi Whale provisions that are brought down any, in any district-wide discussion will ultimately um, fall down onto this land, come down onto this land. So I would say there's no evidence before you as to why this site is different from other urban residential areas. There's an assertion that there's going to be more trains. There's not actually any evidence as to what that means in terms of how these rules should be in place. Um, a couple of notes on, on the evidence that were there. Uh, Ms. Butler referred to a Kiwi Rail standard, and 
if there's any standards for Kiwi Rail, they're internal, of course. But the other thing is when she's describing the provisions that they that they promote, she's describing provisions that they are seeking to impose around the country. But we have varying degrees of where um, things have or have not been um, imposed. And obviously in Auckland, there was an explicit um, rejection of those kinds of provisions through the entry plan. There may well be a different approach in the future. I would have to say that my personal opinion is that these are matters that if they are nationwide, then are best dealt with nationwide. We might end up ideally with an NPS that um, addresses them because at the moment we're doing the same. I think the same issue is coming up throughout the country in different ways. I note that NAV 5, that's so the noise and vibration rule 6.5, already requires ventilation measures to be included for noise zone 2A, which is the one within the 100 metres of the rail designation boundary and uh, logically the 100 metres of the, the road. Uh, Now there's a discussion about the consent, um, sorry, about the building setback. I think it's 2.5 2 meters building setback. That is a matter that's already been addressed through consent orders. Uh, and I think I've got this in front of me now. Just scroll up. This is an environment court consent order on the urban and services plan change. Um, it relates to the Kiwi Rail Appeal on Whanarei District Council. If I scroll down, you will find a rule eventually. Transport chapter. Um, new buildings, excluding minor buildings. Uh, it, for residential zones versus all zones except residential zones, um, at least two metres from the strategic railway line protection areas. Um, at least two metres from the strategic railway and protection areas as shown in the planning map. So there's there's a provision that's sitting in there already in the plan, and we say that's something that logically applies here, can apply here, and we are, after all, um, a zone except the residential zone because we now have the, the commercial zone along all that boundary. And don't, uh, you don't need to take too copious notes because I'm I'll, I'm sure I'll convert some of this into the, the written you can um, listen to the recording afterwards to make sure you pick it all up. All right. Uh, we've discussed the ventilation rules, the fact that they're addressed in the noise zone 2A. Um, with, uh, in terms of vibration, um, there's there's a consistent approach. In, in that case, uh, Kiwi Rail is saying, yes, let's deal with it through the urban services pain changes, and we, we agree with that. And then we come to the noise zone 2A depth, and there was a question from, I think, Commissioner Dimery, to uh, Ms Butler saying, well, how about going down to the road below? And, and she said, yeah, good idea, I like that. Um, we don't. So we, we just don't think you need 250 metres in this location, uniquely as far as I'm aware, um, in the country, because the provisions that we have are those that are being argued about, as I understand it, around the country in terms of a 100 metre gap. Um, You've heard some technical material from Mr. Stiles on, on those matters. The implications of going to a 250 meter band nationally would be really significant. What we are doing at a national level is saying residential intensification is a really good idea alongside railway stations. That's what the unitary plan did in Auckland. It's what the NPSUD is saying we should do with six story buildings there. Um, we have a real tension between this argument that we need to be to a certain level of care uh, within the 250 metres and, and a separate argument that says we need to intensify along these matters, of the, these resources. So we think that the appropriate balance is the one that's that's been sought, as I understand it, by the parties, which is the um, and we're doing, which is a 100, 100 metre zone with a noise zone comes in there with the ventilation, there's construction implications for that. Um, whether there's a air conditioning issue is another matter for another day, in term, I think in terms of the urban and services discussion. But we say that what's proposed is the right and appropriate balance between those potentially competing issues. But again, I'll, I'll get Mr. Ibbotson to perhaps address some of that technical material um, next week.
Um, can I come then to Waka Katahi? Waka Katahi's submission is interesting because it is so broad. It is raising urban form planning issues that we think were resolved by the council at least 10 years ago in terms of planning documents that's reflected by the existing zoning on its site in general terms, because of course there is a centre enabled on the site at the moment, significantly bigger than the one we're promoting now. Um, and most oddly, there seems to be a suggestion that in this area, which currently has extensive industrial land, putting housing will be problematic because the people who live in that housing will presumably drive to Whangarei to work. In the meantime, the people who are going to be working on this industrial land that we've got already will presumably be driving from Whangarei to, to, to Rokaka to work. Now, what's proposed, of course, is to co-locate retail, commercial, residential, employment as a consequence of all that, alongside the industrial areas at Ruakaka and Marsden. It is what you do when you're trying to create an efficient urban form. And I'm really struggling with, with, with Waka Katahi's evidence and its submission, which says those are bad ideas. And it comes along and tells you, we haven't provided public transport. Well, apparently we've got one bus once a week or something to serve the elderly. It's not the applicant or the land developer's role to develop public transport. What the, what the developer and what the applicant is trying to do is to co-locate activity so you don't need as much public transport because you can work from, walk from your house to the shops, you can walk to the commercial development. Um, those things can complement the existing industrial activity in the area and the industrial activity that's proposed to come through the zoning that's in place. So I would say what is proposed is entirely consistent with um, self-containment, I think is the way they, they, the evidence phrased it. It's, it is intended to create an efficient urban form or at least contribute to it as best as one can. And it's a much better way of doing it than it would be simply to leave more industrial activities with no residential or to create a city, a, a centre with industrial around it, but no residential. The, the, one of the most interesting parts of the evidence was um, Mr Norman's statement that he really wants the, he wants the ability for development to be stopped if wider transport projects are not in place. And the wider transport projects are the responsibility of his organisation, his client, um, as a roading authority, and the council as a roading authority. And people who are developing will contribute to that by paying development contributions and, and whatever other mechanism is in place. But the best way they can contribute to efficiency is by developing in the right place and with the right mix of activities. Um, it's, it's very difficult to, to comprehend why, a why the transport authority is saying don't develop efficiently, don't co-locate in the context where we have um, the employment at Marsden a significant distance currently from the main residential area of Whangarei and a planning policy developed over decades that says, notwithstanding the difficulties that we've had to face because of, uh, uh, because of e e um, economic challenges over time, uh, but a planning policy that says it's the right place to develop and we should be doing that in a way that um, takes makes advantage or takes advantage of the the natural um, and and the structural elements that are here already so we're on a main highway we're on the railway almost um, we have a port we have in industrial activities already this is the place where the, the district has said we should be developing and Waka Katahi come along and say don't um, I, I, in terms of uh, GNLC in the Bream Bay Village, there was a discussion about the open space planning, and I'll come to that later. Um, those comments, um, I think, were consistent with and complementary to the position that's been put to you by plan change applicants, saying, we understand we need open space, 
but really we need to do it in a way that enables flexibility when you come to design the development you're going to be doing. And um, I'll come a little later to that plan that, that the council's parks department had in front of you, which is a challenging document and a challenging series of provisions to deal with. Uh, New Zealand refining. Okay, in paragraph 25 of the legal submissions, New Zealand Refining says it operates in accordance with its suite of resource consents. It also says there's a potential for residents at the PC150 site, that's three and a half or four kilometres away, to experience effects associated with the refinery. Mr. Chilton's evidence at para 43 refers you to condition 40, 58 of the consent, which requires no offensive or objectionable odour beyond the boundary of the site. That is part of the suite of consents that the refinery tells you it's operating in accordance with. Then in, in the submissions in paragraph 27, it says operations at the refinery give rise to objectionable owners, including at the, beyond the boundary of the refinery site. Sorry, I've just got a call coming from here. Um, so now we've been told, actually, we do have objectionable owners beyond the boundary site of the site. In 40, paragraph 40 of the submissions, it says complaints are received there's no statement there as to whether those are justified or not justified. And I know the evidence does address that in a bit more detail and says, look, some of the complaints we get aren't our fault. And I fully understand that. They're going to be an easy target. Um, but they get complaints are received from at least 3.5 kilometres from the ends at our site. Now, you would have seen from the plan and the measurements that it cut from a couple of rogues six kilometres away out on the on the um, Pacific Ocean coast, um, most of those complaints seem to be from close proximity or particularly across the water. And, I, and you heard the evidence, I think, saying on quiet mornings, still mornings, that's when the complaints seem to come in. And that makes sense because noise will travel, as, as Mr. Edmondson said, across the water. And if there's odour, it might drift across and there might be an issue. Um, but those are quite specific circumstances and specific locations. In any event, the same complaints are received. Now, that leaves us with a position, I think, that the submissions and evidence from the refinery are an acknowledgement if it's getting complaints in relation to odours that are objectionable beyond the boundary, then it isn't actually complying with its conditions of consent. It might be most of the time, but those, those complaints, if they're legitimate and justified, are a function of not complying with the conditions of consent. What it also says that, though, is that it wants remote landowners three and a half kilometres away to give up any right to complain about such unlawful conduct. And that, I would say, is firstly contrary to public policy. And secondly, if you have a, uh, a covenant on your title, in my experience, it typically says you won't complain about lawful operations. And the problem that the refinery has is if you have a condition that says you won't have objectionable owners beyond the boundary and you have complaints because you do have objectionable owners beyond the boundary, you've got a problem and mismatch between your conditions of consent and your conduct. Now, we simply say that's not a problem for the, for the residents of, a, of an area three and a half kilometres away to solve for the refinery. And you've got a problem with people who live closer to, the, to that than, than that significantly closer, and I suspect they have a problem with people who live in a susceptible location across the harbour because that's just the nature of the, the physics that applies there. Um, now, there was a ref reference in the in the refinery um, submissions to a policy framework that enables infrastructure, and I absolutely accept all that. What it doesn't do is say you enable infrastructure to the extent of enabling what I would characterise as potentially unlawful activity. Um, you, you've, you've got to see that in context. We're not trying to stop the infrastructure. It's there now, clearly. But when you come to imposing rules on something that's four, three and a half kilometres away, um, that's an issue. And I suspect it's an issue that exists already. Now, they then referred to some cases um, down in Marlborough um, and as I understand it, at least one of those related to the, possibly both of them, related to an airport. Quite a different circumstance. And Mr. Stiles' evidence told you how different that circumstance is by saying that it, the aircraft uh, noise effects are the most, 
the, the ones most likely in terms of transport effects to annoy people at a given level of noise of, of average noise. So, and, and then the logic for that's quite clear. If you've got planes buzzing around you all the time, that's a different thing from having a train pass occasionally um, or, or even traffic on a road that's um, alongside you at some point. Um, finally, none of those cases say that you can impose a requirement for a covenant and the reality is you can't, as I've said, that, that it's been used only in my knowledge, to my knowledge, in a plan where it's used to distinguish between activity statuses. But in my submission, you need to have satisfaction that you genuinely have a reverse sensitivity effect, not simply a perception or, or, or somebody potentially lodging a complaint. It needs to be an effect, and I don't think we've got any evidence that gets to that. What we've been told is that people complain, but we haven't been told that the refineries' operations have changed in any way. And they've also said in many cases those complaints aren't justified. So in my submission, um, what you have as a package of relief as the, in terms of the proposal is appropriate to deal with the issues related to the refinery. You don't need to go any further. Um, Ms Hicks referred to climate change matters at some length. Um, that is a very high level matter that the country needs to grapple with. Um, but I'm not sure that this plan change is the place to do it, given that we have um, a policy framework that says um, this is an area where growth will occur, where we have an existing urban zoning for the site. Um, and I, I don't, I'm not going to go any further than that at this stage. We then come to the council as submitter, and there were two topics that were raised, um, wastewater and, and the reserves. So if I can go to the wastewater issue, I can try and find up here. Uh, there's a rule deals with, sorry. It's so much easier when it's in paper. <laughs> no, it's not one of those. <laughs> Maybe it's one of these. Sorry. Uh, uh, Alan, I've got, I've got the ball Mr. open if you want to bring it up. I've got, I've got could, you, could you save up. me? I'll save you. Because it's later, <laughs> I'll save you. Hey, no, I, Mr. Badham did send it to me, which was good of him. So you're talking okay. about the uh, wastewater rule? Indeed I am. I'll zoom. Can everyone see that? I'll zoom in. Um, so there's a wastewater rule here uh, in the three waters management chapters, and it says, subdivision and this is as i think um commissioner dimery was identifying with the witnesses earlier there's a range of reasons why you might need a consent if you're doing subdivision or your subdivision at all there's this one as well and there'll, there'll be others potentially um status restricted discretionary so council can decline where all allotments excluding any allotment for access roads utilities and reserves are designed and located so that provision is made for collection treatment and disposal of wastewater which we'll be doing and connection to a public reticulated wastewater network where the allotment is located within a reticulated wastewater area, which will apply here. Matters of discretion. First, adverse effects on existing reticulated wastewater network. So that's the whole of the network. And that, as I understand it, is what we were being told about today. Secondly, the capacity of existing reticulated wastewater networks and whether the servicing needs of the proposal require upgrades to existing infrastructure. Now, isn't that exactly what the council is telling you we might have to do or it might have to do? So one and two, I don't need to go through the rest of them. One and two, give the council the ability to decline consent if you've got a problem with those matters. And yes, it's a bit difficult because we're going to get to a point potentially where the capacity is used up. Ideally, we won't, because ideally the development contributions will be coming in and the council will be taking steps to implement the infrastructure, perhaps with some assistance from central government that's offering some infrastructure funding in various ways around the country. Um, and we are, we're dealing with, we're ahead of the, the game, but only just, because we don't want the council to spend too much money years ahead and have nothing to show for, for ages. I understand the logic behind that. 
what more does the council need if it has the ability to decline consent for an application in those circumstances? That is exactly the issue it's concerned about. It's um, the, the mechanism is here in the plan and there's no reason to go around imposing additional wording on this site when you have the ability to decline consent in terms of what it matters already. So um, I don't, I think we can stop sharing that screen if we can. Um, I, to me, that answers the issue because we acknowledge council has an issue. It's correctly said, we don't want to stop development. We understand that, nobody does. Um, and it wants the ability to ensure that development doesn't blow through the top of its capacity. But it's got that ability in that provision. Now, I don't know, and nobody explained to me, or explained to us what the problem is with that, why it isn't good enough. What, what, is, what more can you do apart from decline consent? And just adding information requirements and adding specific wording about certain things doesn't actually get around that problem unless the council is looking to say, sorry, we want to treat you differently from other places. Now, there was reference made to um, the, the additional zoning that's come in recently through the urban services plan changes. And Ms Shaw's um, statement dealt with that, and I think very, very quickly, but very accurately. We have been going from resident, from rural land, sorry, to urban land. These provisions tend to be in place. There's some kind of precinct that's got a reference to that. Now, there's two reasons possibly for that. The first is clear one: you're coming from rural, as opposed to coming from existing urban, which we're coming from. But secondly, when I read the dates on that, a number of occasions those are settlements that were reached while the general rule was still outstanding. So somebody says, I really want to get on with it, Council. Can I get my zoning sorted through the, the consent order? There's been a discussion. There's a way of getting that zoning in place. And now they've gone from rural and the courts confirmed you're now urban. Part of that discussion was to put in place a mechanism that de dealt with the wastewater because at that point, Council didn't have certainty on where its wastewater provisions were. It does now. It no longer needs that control, an additional control for this land. It may well no longer need it for the other land, but it's got it um, for those other sites. But in the, ca in the case here, what more can you want apart from the ability to decline? Um, and there was, a, the, um, Ms Osborne spoke to that and I've just, um, she talked about additional matters of discretion, but she didn't really tell us why we need them. Um, she says the provisions don't account for the capacity constraint in the area, but actually they do. We've just gone through the provisions that explicitly talk about capacity. And you don't have to say there is an existing capacity constraint to be able to trigger that debate in terms of this rule. If there's an existing capacity constraint, it's relevant under the rule that we just looked at. Um, and she asserted that without the additional words, there's too much risk, but I wasn't sure what the risk is of. Because from council's perspective, the important thing is to be able to decline if you have a problem. Coming then to, to the reserves, and I just want to put up on the screen, if I can find that one. No, no. Um, the plan, maybe Mr. Bannon, you can help me on this one. I'm looking for the plan that was attached to, oh, maybe here. That one, bingo, yep. got it. Yep. Reading my mind. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I really struggled understanding these provisions that are proposed. If I just, just scroll up a little bit, Mr. Baden, please. So I'm a controlled activity where the subject land is located within the town centre zone, fine, and a minimum of 800 and square, 1,800 square metres of land is identified in accordance with the Marsden City Precinct Plans and Reserves and Indicative Location Plan, invested. 
which is fine if that's the bit I'm dealing with. But if it's not that bit and somebody else has done it, um, if I don't own that bit or, or I, I'm not developing that bit, there's, there's a little issue that arises. But I think that's essentially a pretty easy thing to deal with because it's a relatively small area. The second one, I'm a controlled activity where a minimum of 5,000 square meters of land is identified in accordance with Marsden City Precinct Parks and Reserves Indicative Location Plan and vested. Now, I'm not sure what that means, whether it means one of them's been done, whether it means on, on the piece of land I'm developing, one of these little blue squares happens to be located and I need to vest it. What happens if I've got a, a one hectare block of land I'm wanting to subdivide and I'm told I need to subdivide, I need to give 1500 square meters of it? What happens if people just divide around it? it it's a very difficult rule to make sense of. Then I come to the plan below, which is indicative, and I appreciate they're saying, well, talk to us. But for the reasons that have been expressed throughout the hearing by the, the representatives and the planners for the landowners, it's actually very hard to come up with the best outcome for reserves at this stage. We've got 127 hectares. Where reserves should go and how they might link is a function of some of the activities that you form. So we do have a, a resident, uh, sorry, retirement home that's being developed. That gives us some sense of the shape and what you might do. But um, the, the flexibility that's desirable in the long term, I think, is, is an important aspect of what we're doing. So I, I found the rule that was proposed very difficult to understand, under, very difficult to see how it would apply um, and how it would lead to necessarily a good result. Now, Mr. Badham's some wording to you and or some, some suggestions to you as to how things might progress. It relies upon the way that the council is doing things generally. The city's tried not to um, change things too dramatically, but uh, if there is an outcome in terms of uh, reserves that's better than the one we've got, I'm not sure it's the one that's on the screen at the moment. That is just a, a very difficult mechanism to use and I don't think um, particular, likely to be particularly since, um, uh, successful. And in addition, I can't even understand what the plan is saying with the different squares, different colours of squares, and the, um, how, how it all fits together and how it would possibly be, be run. So clearly, there needs to be some reserves. There's some discussion about the rate, or sorry, the proportion of land that should be going to reserve. That is a function we're told from the council of the activities that you are putting in place and the assumptions made regarding the general residential zoning um, versus, I think, high density or medium density, which was the terminology used, um, create some concerns for the applicant in terms of whether we're getting the, the numbers right, given that the level or the form of development that'll occur here is probably not very, like, very similar to what we're getting in Auckland. So our suggestion is that the provisions and the approach that Mr. Badham has put to you is appropriate. Um, thank you, Mr. Badham. Um, there is, however, I'm going to say um, the last point I, I would make is that there are, uh, it's a lot of material we've heard as well through the course of the hearing. And um, Mr. Badham and, and the team will go away and think about what they've heard. Obviously, um, give some consideration to whether there are ways of improving provisions in response to what people have said, as I'm sure the council planners will be doing. And uh, what I, I suggest we do is that when we come back to you after the council has come back to you, um, we might at that point have a red line version of the provisions to take account of or respond to whatever it is that um, Ms. Ryan and Mr. Burgoyne are suggesting, but also anything else that Mr. Baden thinks um, might and, and others think might improve the mix of provisions that we have because we acknowledge that when you have something as complex as this um, there's always going to be better ways of saying at least some of it if not all of it so that's probably all i need to say at this point and i'm sure we'd all like to go home uh, <laughs> rest. I think, I think so. <laughs> um yes that, that's been oh, i've got a bit of an echo again um, that that's um, really helpful to go through that now and hear that um, direct from you rather than just a, a written reply. So, yes, it's um, 
13 minutes to seven, so I think it probably is time to adjourn the hearing and we we'll continue on the basis of the um, of the timetable we discussed earlier. But um, first, um, thank you to everyone for bearing with us through a very long day. Um, we started early, we finished late, but I think it's probably been worthwhile actually to, to just to, to box through. So um, yeah, thank you to all the um, submitters and their witnesses have come along. Thank you to all of the council staff who've who've um, both presented, um, been there in the background, and and fielded emails um, to myself and um, Commissioner Dimery all day. And um, thank you to my fellow commissioners also um, staying um, on late. So yeah, we're now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. See you all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Dear. Thank you. See you, thank you. See you. Got it.